again at six. All right, I put it on. No, I think we should let people in now. Okay. Now. Okay, lovely. Just checking the settings again. Is it one hour, Chrissy? Is that how long? Up to an hour. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Lovely. All right, I'm going to admit everybody now and then I'll get started with the with the intro and hand over to Chrissy. Okay. Thanks, Emma. No worries. Thanks. All right, got everybody coming in now. Nice to see you all. Lovely. Everybody seems to be in now, so I think we'll get started. So, um, Sorry, one second. So, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Welcome to Avid Readers Zoom discussion entitled Stranger Than Fiction. We have Avid's very own Chrissy Neen, who'll be in conversation with Laura Jean McKay and Patrick Allington tonight. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am broadcasting to you from, the Yagara and the Turrbal people. I pay my respects to your elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, before I leave you, leave you in Chrissy's capable hands, I'd just like to go over a little bit of the information that I sent to you in my email with the event link earlier today. Um, in order to reduce the potential for any disruption and connection issues, you've automatically all been placed on mute. Um, and you'll remain so throughout the evening, but I will unmute you all at the end so that you can join me in thanking um, our speakers this evening. Um, later on, we will probably move to a Q&A session for the last 10 or 15 minutes or so of this event. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box to me. You can find that kind of towards the lower left of your screen. Um, bring it up there. All of your questions will go directly to me and then I will read them out um for our speakers later on in the evening when chrissy prompts me to do so so please send them along um, if you drop out of this session for any reason then you can use the exact same link that i sent you um, to join this event in in the first place again um, and i'll readmit you as quickly as possible the same goes for any of our speakers tonight we've had a couple of connection issues we're hoping that it holds up but um if one of our speakers drops out we'll um do our best to readmit them as quickly as possible and we'll just take a short break while we do so. Patrick's having a few con um, issues with his camera at the moment so he's with us now and you can see him um, for the time being but if we have to we may turn off Patrick's camera so I'm sorry about that in advance. <laughs> um, so I'd now like to introduce you to Chrissy Neen. He'll be taking things from here. I can't speak tonight. Um, as I've already mentioned she's a beloved member of the Avid Reader family. She's also the author of many books, including An Uncertain Grace, which is shortlisted for the Stella Prize, as well as Wintering, which has been shortlisted for several awards. Um, so Chrissy, over to you. Thank you very much, Emma Kate. And hello everybody and welcome to Avid Reader. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders of um, everywhere that you happen to be zooming in from, um, which is right around Australia. And we're also zooming in from New Zealand. Um, so that's very exciting. Thanks, Laura Jean, for taking us the ditch. Um, so I'd like to introduce our guests tonight. Um, we have Patrick Allington, who is a writer and editor. His fiction includes the novel Figurehead, long-listed for the 2010 Miles Franklin Literary Award, as well as short stories published in Mianjin, Griffith Review, The Big Issue and elsewhere. His non-fiction and criticism have also appeared widely. Patrick is a former commissioning editor of the University of Adelaide Press. He has taught politics, communications, writing and editing, most recently at Flinders University. He lives in the Adelaide foothills with his family. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you. And um, we also have Laura Jean Mackay, who is the author of Holiday in Cambodia, shortlisted for three national awards in Australia. Her work appears in Mianjin Overland Best Australian Stories, the Saturday paper, the North American Review. Laura is a lecturer in creative writing at Massey University with a PhD from the University of Melbourne, focusing on literary animal studies. She is the animal expert presenter on ABC Listen's Animal Sound Safari. Um, so it's very exciting to reach out to you across the ditch, Laura Jane Mackay. Good morning, Chrissy. Thanks so much for having me here. It's um, a real pleasure to have this panel here tonight because um, 
I realized as soon as I started reading both of these books that they were going to enter um, my favorite books of all time list. Um, and that's a really exciting thing to start reading and realize that you are suddenly of great ideas and great writers. Um, and I thought that what I would um, start by doing would be getting a little bit of a taste of both of these books. I'll lead with Patrick in case we lose him soon. Um, so Patrick has <laughs> uh, some unnamed global calamity, which leaves the population riddled with tumours without edible food. It is a world of intense government surveillance and a war being raged between the two cities, Rise and Shine. And yet, that war is nothing but smoke and mirrors. In fact, it's this war that sustains the population. The images of the war itself projected throughout both Rise and Shine, twice a day, I think, or maybe more, it's literally the sustenance that they live on. Here is um, the jacket of Rise and Shine for you to see. And Patrick, would you um, grace us with a little bit of... Um, a little bit of rise and shine so we can get a, a taste. Certainly. Thank, thanks, Chrissy. Hi, everyone, and um, great to be with you and, and uh, great to share this set with, with Lord's fantastic. Uh, I'm a bit sick of reading the very start of, of the novel. I've done it a couple of times, so I'm going to read um, from the, a, a few pages in, which is actually what I thought was the start of the novel until about um, uh, 10 minutes before it went to, to, to press. So, um, here's just a, a page or two from near the beginning. In the pitch black, the parrot began to whistle in the rain. It was a forlorn tune to start another day, less nostalgia and more a warning, a reminder that in the old time, people used to love rain, used to open their mouths to it, used to dance in its muddy puddles, used to store and draw on its bounty. It was a, it was a reminder too that birds used to fly about, that they used to exist. The blackness in the village black, it was a forlorn tune to start another day. Less love rain used to open their mouths. To, it was a reminder too, the birds used to sit wall opposite the bed. The image tune to start another day. People used to love rain. Used to open, it, was, it was a reminder too, it began to ease as if the parrot said the image of a top bronze rustling in a gentle breeze. Impossible. It began from the ceiling to the floor. Between them, the plastic parrot and the fake rain woke Walker. That's how it was every morning, now that he wasn't capable of rousing himself at 4 a.m., ready to save the world for another day. He lay face down on the huge hard bed. He dared not sleep on a mattress he might sink into, unable to get up. His naked body was indistinct between a cotton-like plastic sheet. He muttered gibberish, his words upended as the parrot continued to loop the room. We thanks, Patrick. We did um, we did have trouble for a moment there, so we did um, turn your video off. So um, okay. we've lost your picture, but we've got you. Um, we've got your voice now. So um, I think that might be the best that we're going to to get tonight with the with your connection over there. But thank you for that. It gave us a little bit of a taste, even though it was a bit broken up. Um, and I, I do. Um, I insist that everybody goes out and purchases this book immediately. It's a, it's a book of big ideas um, and it's one that you will not regret reading. Um, now I'm going to um, get Jean to give us a little bit of a taste of her book, um, The Animals in That Country, which I have right here. Beautiful jacket. Um, it is about um, a time when Australia comes down with an epidemic. Um, it's called zoo flu, and it quickly spreads throughout the country. After recovering from a fever, people with zoo flu can literally see and smell and hear the language of animals, and in some cases, reptiles and even insects. It's an amazing book um, with a unique voice. I don't think I've read anything like it before. Laura Jean, can you give us a little bit of a um, taste? Well, sure, Chrissy, thank you. Uh, so I'm reading from the middle of the book. Um, page 125, if anyone wants to read along. Uh, and uh, in this part of the book, um, people definitely have zoo flu by now. They're right sort of at, at the same sort of stage we're at um, in, in pandemic world. Uh, so they can understand what other animals are saying. And in this scene, the main protagonist, Jean, meets um, a, a truckload of pigs. <clears throat> a few kilometres later, I slow to stop again. 
A small transport truck with wooden slats for sides is stalled smack bang in the middle of the highway. I can't get around it, but I gather up my hose in case this baby runs on petrol. Pause at the sight of two people standing on the other side, going at each other, hammer and tong. Their faces wrapped up like they're fumigating, pointing angrily at the truck. We are, says the woman. We are not, says the man. <sighs> Hello. Hello. Someone in the murky depths of the tray. <sighs> Hello. It's with us. Visited a children's home once with mum, carrying Bibles to do the Jesus work. The kids on the balcony called hello like that, shy but desperate to be seen by me, who at least had a mum to grab them by the hand and, and pull her past. <sighs> hello. You've broken down, I ask the couple. Who's in there? They ignore me, keep bickering. We're doing it, the woman tells the guy. He folds his arms and the woman rips into him. I'll go fucking crazy. I won't drive any further. I'll leave. Just watch me. His pink eyes narrow. That's money in there. Money didn't talk before. <sighs> Hello. It's with us. Stuff this. The woman stomps away up the road. The guy sizes me up. Hawkers. Good ones too. <sighs> Hello. Hello. The man lets out a shaky sigh. Can hear that hallowing all the way up the, in the bloody cabin. Still got a five hour drive ahead. There's good money in there. Well, I need to get past, trying to find my son, my grandkid, you know. You let them out then. He throws the keys at me and stomps up the road in the direction of the woman. Lost their manners along with their minds. I fish the keys off the ground. The movement is noted by the pigs in the truck their snouts through the slats. Go on, go on. We've got a scary face. No, oh, it went away. Where, where? I'll stop there. My goodness. Um, look, I have, I have never come across a, a, a voice of a book that is like, um, yours before Laura Jean. So can I start there? Did it, was there um, something, was there a moment where you actually discovered the voice of your book? Is that something that happened in an instant or was it like a, a, a long um, job to try and find how to write this book? It was really long. <laughs> it took me about seven years of fairly solid writing. And there's so many voices in this book um, that I, I feel like I was really writing two books at once. So I really had to nail or, or get, find Jean's voice. And um, so she came first and she took many hundreds of thousands of words um, to, to get to her. And then I was like, great, I've got Jean. You know, she's, she's this strong woman who can carry this book. And then I realised I needed to work out how animals speak in a novel. <laughs> so um, that was an entire other process, um, very much of layering and um, exploring, looking at real animals, um, imagining um, how my characters might speak for themselves, separate to real animals, um, experimenting with different voices. It was a beautiful... Um, and completely absorbing process and I don't think it would ever really end. I feel as though I could keep exploring this forever and and um, yeah, it, I would still find out new things about how it might work. You look at pets now, has that um, changed the way you think about um, animals when you see them? <laughs> mm, completely. Um, I feel as though I want to be in dialogue with animals now, um, I feel as though, even though I don't know, <laughs> I feel as though I know um, that they have a, a complete and distinct and full world that is completely separate to me that's going on. And um, I, I really respect that and fear that and wonder about that. Uh, so yeah, they're. Uh, I. I mean, I used to stare at them all the time anyway, and now I'm just obsessed. I suppose. Excellent. Okay, I have to admit, it has changed my relationship to my cat. So <laughs> it's definitely been influential on me. Um, better, I hope. 
<laughs> he always stands at me at night and I'm like, what are you really saying? What are you really saying? <laughs> Standing on my chest. Um, so Patrick, I just want to come to you now. Um, have we got you first? <laughs> I, I'm here. I'm here. Hello, everyone. <laughs> we can... um, uh... Go ahead. Yeah, I'm here in, um, uh, in, in some sort of spirit. Uh... In, a, in a grey box form with your, your name in the front. So I think this is the only way we're going to get your audio tonight. So um, obviously there's some internet issue. But your book, let's talk about it. Um, when I started reading your book, the first thing that came to mind was um, I'm reading something that reminds me of um, the kind of feeling I got when I first discovered Italo Calvino's work. Uh, it, it's a book that um, stimulates your brain in certain places and makes your, your brain think. So it actually makes the reader kind of switch into gear and, and start to, to speed off on ideas, on a, on a journey of ideas. And I noticed that um, your book has been likened um, to um, George Orwell's 1984, to Brave New World and even to Kafka. Um, how did you come to this voice, which is um, quite unique in its own way too? Yeah, the, the voice was very hard, Chrissy, because I, I, it kept, I didn't want um, a narrator who was um, uh, opinionated, uh, but I didn't want a narrator who was dispassionate either. So I, 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 I kept sort of veering between one and the other, um, and I kept finding that the, uh, the the narrator was sort of taking over, uh, and and just it was opinion after opinion after opinion, and this is terrible, and this is great, and I, I didn't want any of that really. I, I wanted to shift between the characters. Um, so 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 that was in terms of the crafting of the book that 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 was that was pretty tricky um uh, and and i think it was the thing that i needed to get the way i wanted it in order to to, to write the story I, I wanted to write which was you know pushed off into the future and 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 sort of grappling with that new way of living were there any books that um you were taking with you on your journey to try and um, help you along to find that voice yeah um i i and the more I think about it, the more there are. Um, but but I probably um, uh, John Wyndham's book, The Chrysalids, uh, is 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 a book that um, uh, I've read many times, um, probably since my teenage years, um, and that that I, I still pick up often. And and often if I can't go to, to sleep at night, that's the that's the book I'll pick up and just randomly read a few pages. So so that that book loomed. Um, very large for me, but the more I think about it, the more um, I feel a bit like the books build on the foundations of of literally hundreds of different books. And I keep thinking of other books and new books that I think, oh yeah, that, it's really that's the foundation and that's the foundation. And I sort of want to sort of pile them all up together and and make a great big hill and stand on top of it and say sort of it's it's a contribution that sits sort of somewhere amongst all of these uh, all of these other books um uh, and almost by the day i think of something else that's that sort of oh yeah yeah it's that's that's sort of that's a strong influence or that's a strong influence yeah uh, you can kind of you, you can kind of feel that it's in it's in a group of books and that those ones that i mentioned were, were some that um kind of did feel right for it um in terms of the characters that you have did this did the story come first or did the characters come first you've got barker but um barton and walker um and you've got quite a, a a large cast of characters in this book but um for me it felt like the the strength of the book was um the ideas behind it first and the characters second is that how it came to you or was it the characters that came fully formed uh, yeah, the, the, you're right. The story came first, and and um, really, I, I started sort of grappling with ideas of food and drink, and uh, and thinking about a future where we couldn't have food and drink, but but wanting to talk, write about survival and and resilience and and somehow carrying on. So so that was the sort of kernel of 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 the book for me. That that trying to think about that idea of 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 hanging on somehow and of, of, you know, having some hope for the future and for the characters having some hope for the future, but also, you know, maybe me having some hope for the future, but, but on the other hand, dealing with, with, you know, a reason amount of despair if, if uh, I think about, you know, what the world might be like in 50 years um, and the characters similarly looking back and looking at what they've lost. Um, so that, that was the starting point. The characters came second. 
I'll just um, go over to Laura Jean. Firstly, um, did you did you have any models of books that you were kind of um, keeping in your head when you were writing? Uh, like Patrick, um, so many and 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 the same as Patrick. I, I remember books all the time. The other day, I remembered that um, when the wind when the wind blows, that um, sort of epic apocalyptic um, cartoon was probably one of the first. Um, books that I, I turn to, even though it's not about um, talking animals, it's not about pandemic, but it was the feeling that's contained in that book and, and the very sort of normal world um, that, that begins to unravel through this, this devastating change um, that, that I wanted as well. But I'd completely forgotten about that sort of legacy book. Uh, as I started to think about how animals could be in, in fiction and how they were represented, uh, I came across uh, Eva Hornung's Dog Boy, uh, which is one of those books that just changed the way I looked at other animals in the world. Uh, I've never looked at a dog the same way since. Uh, the same thing happened after I read um, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating. I remember um, the first time I walked uh, along a wintry path and heard that devastating crunch after reading that book I was you know um you know the the whole world collapsed uh so so books like that um have really influenced me there's a wonderful writer called Suniti Nam Joshi who writes books called things like The Conversations of Cow which are book length meditations um from philosophical cows uh and and reading books like that really sort of open doors to the way that that animal dialogue might be represented alexis writes the swan book just um you know took my mind apart and put it back together so um uh yeah there are there are just so many incredible works out there uh that really really helped me along and these works are still coming out now um the octopus and i has just been released um along with chris flynn's mammoth and these are two more books that that have these animal dialogues that i'm really excited about i've been reading um a book called braiding sweetgrass recently um and that talks about indigenous understandings of animal world and that actually brought me closer to understanding your book because there's something um, about the way um, of the personhood of animals which um, Indigenous cultures has which reminded me and I wondered whether you'd you delved into Indigenous understanding of, of animals when you were writing. I haven't read that book and um, in Indigenous understandings of, of other animals um, was something that from the first person perspective of Jean who is uh, a, a very um, frustrating character. Um, she willfully will not access um, uh, knowledge like indigenous knowledge. She just she just gets a block up about that. And I wanted to sort of showcase that um, that lack of willingness of, of settler colonialism to to um, appreciate and um, honour the legacy um, that that is in this land and that is in Indigenous cultures and what what could be shared there. Um, so it was it was sort of a, a very purposeful lack there. Um, but I I would love to read that book, Chrissy. I mean, what what's it called? It's called Breaking Sweet Grass. I'll email you later about it. It's a wonderful. <laughs> Um, but I also um, was interested in your characters. Uh, I mean, Jean obviously is the main character, but is she? Um, for me, Sue soon took over from Jean, and Sue, of course, is a dingo. Um, and so you only really catch glimpses of Sue's voice through Jean's understanding of Sue's voice, which is very misinterpreting. It's really misinterpreting what she's saying. And yet, um, as the book went on, Sue took over in my mind as being the strongest character in the book. Was that something that you were intentionally doing? Yeah, so there's a real power shift. Um, I'm very interested in how power works, especially with humans and other animals. There is a really real power shift um, that occurs between Jean and Sue. At the start, um, as you say, Jean thinks that Sue is calling her queen and she quite likes that. And that's sort of that, um, that imperial idea um, coming through. And then as the 
book develops, as people become sicker, as the world unravels, um, Sue becomes increasingly important to Jean until Jean completely relies on Sue. And so you're right, um, Sue's uh, real language starts to come through. Um, she starts to own the book. And Sue in herself um, has had a really hard life. She's been taken um, from the community she was born on. She's been put on show. Um, she doesn't know whether she's a wild dog or um, a dog in captivity. And in fact, she's both. Um, and she sort of represents that really uncertain, uneasy relationship that we have with dingoes in Australia, uh, where we call them feral, we call them pests, we call them pets. We call them um, native, we call them introduced. Uh, and she's so she's constantly balancing everything in her personality. And I'm, I hope that that makes her bigger and bigger as the book goes on. It sure does. She's an amazing character. I will remember Sue forever, I think. She'll be large in my mind, which is great. Um, Patrick, I might come to you now. Um, it was interesting that um, Laura Jean talked about Raymond Briggs's. Um, uh, book. Um, oh, gee, what's that called now? I've forgotten. Oh, when, when the wind blows, um, because there's a politeness in the post-apocalyptic world of that book. There's a certain British politeness with everyone being close to each other, even though um, the bomb's just been dropped and everyone is dying. And there's a certain politeness in your book that kind of um, holds the book together. Um, I wonder whether you were specifically looking at that politeness and that, um, you know, how you, you think about, zo you know, you think about the zombie apocalypse and you think about post-apocalyptic things as people attacking each other and killing each other. But in your book, everyone's just being super polite to each other. Yeah, I was uh, interested in um, Laura's reference to when, when the wind blows as well. That's, um, that's, uh, that book is somewhere sitting in my office here under a pile of other books. I can't quite uh, put my hands on it at the moment, but it's, it's another one of those books that I've gone back to again and again and again. It's, um, uh, I, I think one of my, one of the handful of my, of the most favorite books I've, I've, I've read and, and, and owned and, and gone back to over and over again. Uh, and you're right. It's, it's, uh, the, the politeness in that in that book is quite startling. Um, the politeness in in the the community in the city state of Rise in in my book, it's a bit of a double edged sword. It's real, uh, and and it comes out of a shared sense of survival and and communal spirit and the sense that no one should be left behind. And those things are real. Um, uh, uh, the the leaders also deploy it as a technique, but they they mean it as well. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think I was thinking about that issue of politeness as as a virtue that I think is important and meaningful, uh, and you know something we could use a little more of uh, in our day to day, day interactions, um, and in our uh, in our public conversations. But on the other hand, uh, politeness is the need and the, and the necessity uh, and the ideal of politeness is deployed as a way of stopping people from speaking back and some, sometimes people should have the right to speak back and, and, and um, politeness becomes a way of, of deflecting um, and, and, of, uh, and of demarcating who, who has the right to speak and, and who doesn't. So I, I guess I was trying to grapple with that. Uh, uh, that may be a retrospective uh, reflection on my part. I'm not sure how hard I was thinking about that as, as, I, was, as I was writing it. Um, I was also trying to make it funny. So, so there's an element of that, uh, that as well. I, I was going to ask you about humour, actually, because both of your books um, are incredibly funny at times. And um, that is, in a way, the, the way we can um, deal with the tragedies at the heart of both of the books. Um, how, how, do you, um, how do you relate to comedy? Do you find it um, is essential in a book which is about serious things, Patrick? Yeah, I think it's essential and, and it's... Um... It's, uh, I mean, for me, comedy is super serious. There's, there's nothing um, uh, inane or flippant about about comedy, uh, and um, uh, and so it's not a. It, it does perhaps assist um, in reading, in my case, a, a novel about a. a a world where eight billion people have died, and there's a, a handful of people left, um, and and 
doubly so given the year we've all been um, uh, experiencing. Uh, but it's um, for me, it's 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 a good deal more than that. I I, I hope, and it's it's a way of uh, of burrowing a bit deeper. Uh, I hope, um, but also novels are ideally a little bit entertaining some of the time. Uh, so it's 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 a little bit of just that as well. It's certainly assuming the jokes work, of course. And and it it certainly is a way of getting into um, some difficult ideas and I think that the comedy kind of holds it together it's like the glue really with your book which really works fantastically um Laura Jean um your book's funny too uh, and um I, I didn't really think about it um as a comedy until I was thinking about I was reading Patrick's book and thinking they both use humor um to kind of lead um the audience through some really difficult terrain were you aware of your use of comedy while you were writing well, uh, I mean, um, it, it's funny because it's very funny. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, our relationship with other animals is is so serious. Um, what we do to them and and how we are with them is deadly serious, actually. Um, when when you start to look into it. Um, so I was sort of exploring this idea and getting deeper and deeper and more and more horrified at myself and the world. Um, but also when I spent time with other animals, I would remember how very funny they are and that part of the joy of being with non-human animals is uh, the humour and the wonder uh, that come through in that relationship. Uh, I don't... I don't have pets in my life, unfortunately, but um, interacting with wild animals can be very, very funny. I used to share a, a deck space with a magpie who considered my deck, my deck, very much her deck, and um, she'd drop the kids off um, for me to look after during the day and, and take off. And one day I was eating some nuts um, out of my hand and she would like some. Um, and I didn't want to give them to her. Nuts are bad, I think, for magpies. Um, and then she hopped on my computer, my laptop, and her little claw just hopped on the backspace and started systematically deleting my thesis. Delete, delete, delete. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> purposeful or not, it's it's often a, um, just a side-splittingly funny relationship that we can have if we try. <laughs> Kind of like the um, the Sue um, relationship, you know, the the kind of idea that if you can actually find out what the animals are thinking of us, it's actually quite, you know, it is quite funny because um, we take ourselves very seriously, and yet they obviously do not in your book, <laughs> which is great. Um, I wondered whether both of you, um, you know, you're both writing these books a long time before um, COVID. And then we got COVID. Um, how did it feel to release books into a world that was going to be overrun by a pandemic? Um, Patrick? Are you there? Yeah, Chrissy, it was, it was a little, yeah, are you getting me? Yeah, it was a little weird. Uh, but uh, look, I think just in terms of the practicalities, I, I, I think about uh, artists who are, uh, musicians and who need to go into into spaces and perform live and and uh, actors uh, and I think uh, probably in the overall scheme of things I've got off fairly lightly uh, so it, on, a, on a practical level um, it's been a little different but it's uh, I, I think um, there are a lot lot more lot worse things happening um, uh, every day around us at the moment in, in a in a sort of um, I don't know philosophical sense. I guess it's, it's it's it feels strange because I I'm feeling very strange inside my head, um, and I'm finding it very hard to read. I'm doing a lot of reading, but I'm I must I often have four or five books on the go in a in a non COVID nineteen uh, period of time. Uh, I, I must have thirty five or forty books on the go at the moment, I, and um, I'm reading quite a lot, but I I can't finish anything, and I can't can't concentrate on the one thing for for more than um a few pages often um so it, it's strange to me to be to be putting a book out into the world uh when i'm finding reading 
uh, a bit of a challenge and, and the type of reading I'm doing is quite different to what I would I would usually do. Um, and, and then um, the subject matter, uh, humour or not, is uh, not necessarily all that cheerful in the context of uh, people being stuck at home and, and, and dealing with health issues and, and uh, workplace issues and, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but it, it is what it is. Are you able to write, Patrick? Oh, uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> you? Um, what I do write is very weird, even weirder than what I wrote last time and comes out in snippets. Um, it's almost like little messages to myself or someone. It's very weird. I, I wonder. Um, I wonder for both of you because what I've been noticing as a writer in this time is that if you are writing a book which is a contemporary fiction book, um, this uh, COVID's kind of shot you in the foot in a way. Yeah. If you write about now, you have to write about right now, this second, because you have to include the pandemic and it's changing all the time. So you have to include the pandemic where we're at in this current moment. Um, and even if you said it next year. We have no idea what travel is going to be like or work is going to be like or anything next year. So you can't look forward in a way you can't have post-COVID books because they're going to get it really badly wrong. Is, have you been thinking, have either of you been thinking about that in terms of your writing? In terms of reading, I have. I, was, um, I had two books on the go, Ronnie Scott's The Adversary and uh, Ling Ma's um, The Severance, Severance, Ling Ma's Severance. And uh, Severance is a post-apocalyptic fiction and The Adversary is a realist now fiction. The Adversary became this sort of nostalgic, wondrous other world that I couldn't access anymore. Whereas Severance, which is this sort of hell in New York of sort of zombie apocalypse flu, became what is happening now. So uh, I don't know that there is, um, is there speculative fiction anymore or has speculative fiction become realist fiction? I can see Jane Rawson going. <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. I think you're on the money. I think that if you're not writing spe speculative fiction at the moment, you're writing speculative fiction. <laughs> Weird. Or you're writing an historical novel. Yeah, you're writing a historical novel or you're writing, um, you know, something that's speculative about now, something that's in an alternative universe where COVID never happened, 2020 without COVID. It's just the weirdest thing for a writer. Patrick, are you, I, I mean, obviously your last book was a speculative fiction. Have you been thinking about whether you could write contemporary fiction anymore or what's, where, where is your head? Uh, what? Uh, well, my head's all over the place. Thanks, thanks for thanks for asking. But um, uh, I, I've actually the, the the fiction I'm working on is, um, uh, and I was I, I had been working on it before we find, we all found ourselves um, dealing with the uh, with the the pandemic. Uh, is uh, about um, exile, so it's and it's set in a sort of it's a kind of realist novel but it's sort of set in no place so it's it's not sort of anchored in a in a a known uh place or 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 time quite and so it's not about a pandemic and it's not about lockdown but it's about exile and and so I'm I'm finding some very weird parallels uh with um uh that story which I I started well before um, we found ourselves in in the events of 2020, um, but it's changing and deepening and and messing with what I what I thought I was writing uh, in in ways that are a little, little bit surprising. In, in the meantime, in the same way, I'm finding it hard to to um, concentrate on one piece of reading. I'm finding it hard to concentrate on this piece of writing, and so I'm doing a. a I am writing in a way, but I'm I'm writing in my head mostly. I'm not necessarily typing or or, or writing. I'm I'm thinking about the story uh, most days, but not necessarily doing spending a lot of time actually putting any words um, physically uh, anywhere. And and uh, that that's um, that's how I often imagine my way into a piece of fiction. Um, but once I'm writing, I don't usually continue this way. So this is this is a new thing for me to, to, to have quite an evolved draft and to have almost stopped writing, but to be thinking. Um, 
uh, and I, I don't not quite know what to make of it, and, and I don't know what will happen when I start trying to type again, and it, and it, and, it, and it comes out. Uh, but it's it, it's interesting and it's different. So, do you think you need to reimagine some of the things that you wrote into it because of the new understanding of isolation? What 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 I what I was doing before was just making it up. Uh, and n now, um, uh, I, I mean, it's not that I'm in, I've been in some severe lockdown, but I've got a slightly different insight into um, into isolation and exile than I might have I might have had um, six months ago. Uh, and it's it's making me rethink a few things um, more more on an emotional level than on a on a on a plot level. Um, uh, I, I think I'm starting to ask a bit more of my characters and what they're thinking and how they're reacting over over a period of time. Uh, than I was before, which is uh, probably a good thing for the for the story. It might might suggest that the draft was a bit superficial on a on a couple of levels, um, and and that this is uh, a way of making me, you know, ask myself some hard questions about the story that, that I'm writing and how I'm writing it and what I'm doing with it and and what what the story really is and what really happens to the people and how they how they react and so on. This might be an amazing thing for your book. We may get the book that we need. That sounds like the book that we need right now, actually. So let's hope that you get that. It seems, seems, seems an extreme way to go about, uh, you know, finishing a piece of work, but uh, there we have it. Throw a pandemic at it. Let's see how that goes. Yeah. It's all happened for you. You caught <laughs> Yeah, I, f I feel, fully, feel fully responsible. <laughs> you totally are. Laura, Jean, have, you, um, have you thought about... I mean, you said you're writing um, in small segments at the moment, and it's is is it that there's an element of um, poetry and almost sort of little your your book fits almost between a novel and verse novel at times. Like I kind of felt like I was going. I love verse novels; they're one of my favourite things to read. And I I felt like I was just kind of opening up into verse novel land. Um, is the stuff that you're writing now? Does it feel like it's in that kind of poetic? Um, kind of area or is that where the pandemic's taken your head? Maybe maybe it does. I mean the the dialogue in in the animals book um, I think of as sort of more like songs or song lyrics I think. Um, uh, yeah yeah um, I think yeah I, I guess I get a tunefulness from them but it's really nice to hear that they're even vaguely as coherent as, as um, something um, leaning towards a verse novel. What I'm writing now, it's interesting hearing Patrick talk about it because I, I feel the same. I was I was starting to write about a woman um, who was sort of trying to get out of a room. That was all I had for her. Um, and now <laughs> this pandemic started and I'm realising that she probably won't get out of the room anymore. She's she's going to be there for a while. Uh, and and um, she is speaking in... in in short snippets, she's sending out messages. So in a way, it's probably almost more social media related, or or something like that at the moment. But I don't, I don't really have any form. And like Patrick, it's it's um, it's a lot in my head, um, and there is a lot of time for thinking at the moment, uh, which is which is interesting. Uh, but yeah, in it in a sort of global devastation way. There's, um, there's actually three words from um, your animals book that I have written above my workstation, which I will um, keep there for the duration of my writing life, I think, um, which is <laughs> dead sky meat. Um, when um, Sue calls rain dead sky meat. And it, the thing that it did, the little fizz and pop that went off in my head when I saw rain that way um, through the, you know, through Sue's eyes um, really kind of, it changed my way of thinking about things, which um, is amazing. So I do hope that your new um, book um, continues in the, those short little snippets and those little ideas that um, can really change your thoughts. Um, well, my words might have made it anywhere near where you write, Chrissy, is just <laughs> the highest compliment. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, dead sky meat. Remember that. Dead sky meat. Um, and the other thing, the thing that I took away from, um, the words that I took away from Patrick's book were malignantly complacent. These two words that popped off the page, um, malignantly complacent, and um, echoed for me in terms of where we're at 
in life at the moment and how we got here um, in terms of, you know, climate change, in terms of our relationship to other people and in terms of the pandemic as well. So, um, Patrick, I just thought I'd, I'd let you know that those two words that you put in the book um, feel like they sum up um, something about the world at the moment. That is all I wanted to say about that. Um, <laughs> so I, I would actually would like to open out to questions. Um, if there's anyone from the audience who has any questions for the team, um, please type them in the type box. And Emma Kate, have you got any questions from the audience? Um, yeah, I've got two. I'll start with Josephine's question. Um, it's for both of you, Laura and Patrick. Um, have you read each other's books? And if so, have you found any correspondences between them? Um, I've, I've just started reading Patrick's book. Um, I'm, I'm not that New Zealand doesn't get things, but it, it is taking a while for the ships to arrive. So um, then I caved in and got her on e-reader. Um, and it's just, I don't know, it's just, I'm, I'm such a, a fan of apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic post uh, fiction. And it is just taking me to such a different place, um, this place of, of screens um, and intense um, unified um, systems, uh, yes. So, 1984, which is was definitely one of my favourite books. Um, so, Brave New World. It's it's really cool, Patrick. <laughs> and I know uh, Patrick, you've read Laura's book. Yeah, I, I have, and um, it, it's uh, I haven't finished many books uh, this this year, but I've I've certainly finished Laura's book and. Uh, look, the thing that, uh, I mean, I loved it at, and on several levels and what really interested me is a couple of things. One is that it sort of, it seemed to turn and shift and become different books uh, as it carried on, as, 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 the, as the story unfolded. Uh, and so, sometimes that seems like, well, well, maybe the book's lost its momentum or something, but it was the opposite in this case. It, it, it turned into something else and then it turned into something else. It was, it was metamorphizing um, uh, as, I, as I read it, which, which is a, a startling thing for, for a reader. So, so that was one thing. Uh, the other thing was the, the pure inventiveness uh, of it. But in that, I, I, f I felt like it felt so true and real. And, and that's an astonishing thing to say about a, a book that's, that's populated by talking animals. Uh, that that it felt so so real and it it felt embedded in in truth and in in deep research um, in in ways that really elevated it beyond um, just telling an interesting story. It became something else for me. I wonder whether um, reading these books um, right now has um, I would really like. To, I wish I had read these books before the pandemic and then had a chance to reread them during the pandemic because um, there's a certain there's something an echo or a resonance or something that is kind of echoing out from both of these books at the moment. And and as Laura said um, when you were um, saying about reading the difference between reading a realist fiction where it became this uh, this kind of twee kind of thing of the past rather than something of the moment. Um, I wonder whether reading books has changed um, for good, for, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure when we will come back to normal in terms of, of reading again. Um, anyway. I just, I just felt so relieved when I saw um, Rise and Shine and that it was coming out, you know, I was like, oh, thank God, okay. Patrick Ellington is, is releasing a, a, a post-apocalyptic novel, you know, I'm going to be okay um, because I'm, I'm such a fan of your writing, Patrick. So, yeah, it is really amazing that even though they're such different books, that they are rolling out at the same time with the same publisher as well. Yeah. Scribes onto something. <laughs> many post-apocalyptic books that um, have come out this year, actually. I've, I've been really quite surprised with um, the amount of books that deal with um, this subject and obviously it takes you know six months to a year in that lead up time to the book actually coming out so this is what writers were thinking the world would be like a year ago and here we are um, I don't know um, whether that felt like that for both of you seeing your books come out at this time 
Yeah, it's interesting, Chris, because I, I think that, that um, most people I know have been looking ahead and thinking, "Oh shit, we're, we're you know we're in a bit of trouble here." Um, uh, and uh, so, so the 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 world is full of prescient people uh, at, at the at the moment because uh, there's probably literally billion, millions of us uh, looking ahead and 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 seeing a, a, a version of our future that's uh, that's crazy but kind of truthful mm. and I, it's to see that we don't have you know we talk about the spanish flu now um and look back to the spanish flu but we don't have the the great spanish flu novels like you know there are none that mm. i've read that um that kind of are written about that particular period of time so i wonder what's happening to people writing about the present day you know if you're writing a romantic comedy 2020 in Australia. Uh, are you weaving um, the pandemic into your current everyday romantic comedy? Will it be a, a great pandemic romantic comedy or not? That's, it's an interesting question. I don't expect either of you to have an answer, but um, maybe maybe someone does. I don't know. Maybe we'll know in a year or two. Who knows? Maybe it's more interesting what happens after as we... as. Um, uh, and maybe we're seeing that at the moment. That the, the attempts to open up a little bit uh, are um, a bit more complicated than than when it when everyone was told just to stay home. Uh, and you know what happens over the next year or two in terms of um, storytelling uh, m may uh, t tell us something more about ourselves than than that time when there was not much choice but for everyone to to, to sit at home. I'm not sure. Um, did you say you had another question, Emma Kate? I've had a few more now, if you're happy to continue with them. Um, so we have a question from Bianca. Bianca's question is for both Patrick and Laura again. And Bianca says, could you talk a bit about how you've approached pitching your novels, getting them published and the editing process, please? Who wants to go? Patrick? Sure. Um, so uh, I uh, pitched this novel to agents um, uh, on the basis that I'm a bit lazy and they're better that, at doing that stuff than I, than I am. Um, and uh, uh, look, I, a, a agent who made a, a several very uh, on the on the mark suggestions. So I did a little bit of editing on on the on the manuscript that he had accepted. Um, uh, before he then sent it out to uh, to publishers, uh, by he I say um, the very excellent Martin Shaw, one of um, uh, Australia's uh, and now Germany's uh, great supporters of Australian writing, uh, and uh, so then it went to, to a number of publishers, and, and when Scribe took it, um, uh, David Golding, who who was who edited the book, uh, uh, took such a interesting and deeply thoughtful. Uh, uh, approach to to the editing that um, uh, the book is much better than it was when he received it. Um, and as a pr professional editor myself, like I, I just take great delight in working with with an editor who who knows exactly what they're doing. Uh, and and uh, you know that that process is is a, you know privilege and a joy. Uh, and um, we didn't edit the book heavily, uh, but the the changes either one of us made and that, and that we then agreed on uh, were uh, extremely important as I look back on it now on, on, on the way the book settled and, and what, what the book turned into. Laura Jean? Um, well, The Animals in the Country has uh, an early version, a much too early version of it, um, has the great um, privilege of being rejected by most literary agents in Australia. Um, uh, one notable comment was that it was relentlessly grim, <laughs> which I kind of wanted on the cover. It isn't relentlessly grim anymore. I made it. I made it funny. Um, but I, so I went. Uh, I just went and um, approached publishers um, myself, and um, yeah, had was really fortunate to um, to find Scribe at a pretty early stage, uh, and to find um, my editor at Scribe, Marika Webb Pullman who just saw the book and um, was on the same page as me, every page, uh, 
and did beautiful editing. Um, I would go into her office for a, a 20 or 30 minute meeting and two hours later, after a passionate sort of um, debate about dialogue and ex how exactly a mosquito needed to speak um, <laughs> on a page, <laughs> we would sort of emerge blinking into the sunlight. Uh, it was just such a joy to work with them. And I'm not an editor, but I exactly the same as Patrick. I just love the editing process. I love an editor who is passionate. I, I said to Marika from the very start, you have to push me right to the edge, you know, I'm tough. Like, let's take it there. And um, and we did, I, I think. So, yeah, it was a great, it was a great process. But finding the right, the right publisher um, was everything. Uh, so, and this was a publisher whose books I, I read and love as well, so. Emma Kate? Awesome. Yep, um, so we've got kind of, we've got one more for Patrick and one more for, um, for Laura, if that's okay. So um, I'll start with your question, Patrick. It's from Andra. Andra says, um, I'm halfway through your book and I'm wondering why it is that mostly violent scenes help to feed hungry people and not other emotional types of scenes. Uh, yeah, excellent question. Uh, I, I think I wanted to... Um, uh, when when I started thinking about uh, empathy and and people's capacity to to literally eat in a, in a different way, uh, I was also thinking about the way that in our existing world uh, we uh, come close to literally feeding off off uh, war scenes and war footage and violence um, day in day out, both both manufactured violence through through uh, cinema and television but but uh, also increasingly um, uh, scenes of actual violence that we have much more exposure and access to than, than we might have in in years past even the relatively recent past uh, so I, I don't have an answer beyond that it's the it's the um, it's the depiction that I, that I guess uh, I found a little shocking so I, I will worked with it from from there great thank you um so we actually have two more questions for laura jean but i'm going to tie them in together because they're both commenting again on your animal voices laura jean and so claire has said um can you talk more about the format you chose for the animal voices beyond the lyrical and she said i was so moved by maternal non-human animals and then anna has said um that you've practically created a new dialect through the animal's symbolic and metaphoric language. Um, and do you miss it? Do you feel like you want to write other pieces in this language? Uh, oh, they're such great questions. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the last one. Um, I, yeah, I don't think I'll, I'll ever stop whether, whether I continue to actually write um, this dialogue or whether I just can, continue to have these dialogues in my head when I'm staring obsessively at other animals. I'm not sure, but um, as I said earlier, I, I don't think it is something that ends and I would like to write more um, in a non-fictional way, which isn't usually a form um, that I write that much in about how we might continue to write animals on the page and um, the different things that we could consider um, and um, thing and sort of, tips from other writers and maybe myself about how how we might work through this process. Um, I don't know that there is a definitive guide on how exactly to portray um, a pig um, and how they might speak and, and I'd, I'd love to start to work through some of those ideas. Uh, in terms of um, how the dialogue was actually set out on the page, in a way um, I was kind of struggling to work through those horrors of anthropomorphism and who am I to, to represent animals. Um, and in a way, once I had worked out how it was visually, how it visually sat on the page, that really helped me with what the animals were saying. And I really entered into the dialogue through the insects. They were my way in. Um, they scream. Um, to me, they're screaming joyously. Um, they're flinging themselves um, literally across the white page 
um, you know, um, yelling their, their intent and their wants and needs and last in the world. And so once I could do that, once I'd let myself um, speak through an insect in all caps, um, then I could start to find my way into the way that birds might use italics and emphasise different words and the way that Sue in particular is constantly um, grappling with these two sides of herself where she might say, you know, I, I love you and then in brackets, but do I really or no, I don't or something. And so she's constantly got this, got this captive wild thing going on. Uh, and, and that was really, really fun to work with punctuation uh, in that way. Fantastic. I the questions. <laughs> well, they're really good questions. Thank you everyone for that. Uh, look, I, I actually highly recommend both of these books. Um, I think I, from now on, I'm only going to moderate panels of books that I adore. So, um, <laughs> so come and join me for, for some more books that are wonderful soon. But these two really are life changing. Um, and I think at this time when um, the world is strange and when reading um, realist fiction feels like historical fiction, um, these two are a bit of an antidote for that. So I'd like to thank, oh look, we've got Patrick's face back. So I'd like to thank Patrick to his face um, for writing the wonderful Rise and Shine, which is available at Avid Reader, and we do post out if you're not in um, if you're not in the Brisbane area. Um, and also um, to thank Laura G. Mackay for um, the life changing the animals in that country with a very glittery cover as well. Thank you guys very much for joining me for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Chrissy. Thank you, Patrick, and and for everyone for being here. We might can we open open the um, floor up for um, for people to clap now? So if you're yeah. in the audience, we're going to open. I don't think I can do it. Uh, allow it for you, Chrissy. There we go. So you can yeah. clap if you want for a final clap. Um, I'm going to. Hey, there you all are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.